Hey everyone, in this video, I want to provide a deep dive into the new Azure Virtual Network Manager. And as the name suggests, it's all about managing virtual networks in Azure. As always, this is useful. Uh, please go ahead and like and subscribe. Now in many organizations, we have multiple virtual networks and we have to think about well the connectivity between those virtual networks and maybe how do we manage security rules, traditionally things like NSGs, um, around them. So if I think about just a virtual network, so I can have the idea of a particular virtual network. And remember, we define virtual networks by CIDRs, IPv4, IPv6 address ranges. But if I think about a virtual network, it's bound by a number of different things. For example, a virtual network, well, it cannot span regions. So a virtual network is going to be bound within a specific region. And also, virtual networks cannot span subscriptions, i.e. be used by something in a different subscription. So if I have multiple subscriptions, if I'm using multiple regions, I'm often going to end up with multiple virtual networks. So I might think about, hey, I've got a VNet over here, VNet over here, VNets over here. And if I want them to be able to communicate, now there are different patterns with how we want them to communicate. I might have a hub and a spoke. So there's some hub network with core services, maybe gateways to on-premises or other networks. We so just want spokes to connect to that hub. Or maybe it's a mesh. I want everything to speak to everything. And maybe it's a combination. Hey, I want everything to speak to everything, but maybe still use gateways in a central hub. Now, the way we've enabled this currently is we think about peering. So I add in these peering connections. One of the challenges, though, when I do that peering is it's not transitive. So in this scenario, these spokes cannot speak to each other. I would actually have to go and add peerings between all of the different spokes. So there's obviously a certain amount of overhead with doing that. I can enable transitivity via the hub if I put something like an Azure Firewall or NVA in the hub, and then have user-defined rules, user-defined routes to say, hey, to get to this IP space, hop via this one, there's really a lot of work in doing that. And then if I think about challenges of, hey, I wanna be able to lock things down or control traffic, well, within a virtual network, we break it into subnets. So I might have kind of a subnet one, a subnet two, and we create these network security groups. So I can create an NSG, which is made up of multiple rules but then we assign that at a subnet or a NIC level. And that NSG has to exist in the same region as the virtual network, the same subscription. So there becomes a whole set of management problems when I want to centrally and manage this at scale. And that's really the key challenge we face. How do I do my management at scale? And as you might expect, well, this is where the Azure Virtual Network Manager really comes into play. That's the whole point of this, is to help me get, yes, that management of scale, but also maybe add additional functionality and simplify a lot of the different things we actually need to do. Now, throughout this demo, I will show things via the portal. Understand I'm recording this during the preview time. Things in the portal may change, but the core constructs will remain. Now, when I think about using Azure Virtual Network Manager, there's a set of components that really come into play. The first one is I create an instance of an Azure Network Virtual Manager. So I call this AVNM1. So that's a specific instance of Azure Virtual Network Manager. Now, when you create this, you do create it in a certain region, but it doesn't limit the networks it can manage. 
It can still manage networks across regions, across subscriptions, even across tenants. So this instance is given a certain scope of what it's going to manage. Now, when I think of scope, what does that mean? If I think about Azure, we have the idea of, well, there's an, an Azure AD instance at the top of all of our subscriptions, our enrollments potentially. Then we have management groups. Management groups enable us to organize our resources, maybe for the purposes of uh, budget, for policy, for role-based access control. So there's an idea of, well, there's a root management group, and then I can create whatever hierarchy of management groups I may want to meet my various requirements. Then ultimately what will happen is subscriptions roll up. So I might have a, a sub one to a particular management group. And then within the subscription, well, it's going to have maybe one or more VNets. So maybe I have a VNet one, a VNet two. So maybe it's using multiple regions. Maybe I have a prod and a dev, whatever that might be but we have a hierarchy within Azure. And so when I create an instance of Azure Virtual Network Manager, one of the first things I do is I set a scope. Now, one of the things I might say is, well, I want an instance to manage my entire organization. So maybe this instance, I'm gonna set the scope at the root. because so it's gonna be able to manage every virtual network in my entire organization. And then I say, well, which capabilities of Azure Virtual Network Manager do I want to use? If we maybe look at this quickly, so I've already created one, but if I was to say create a new one, we can see all of those things come into play. So yes, you create it in a certain region, but then the two key things is, well, what is the scope? So we can see here down here, I have to pick a scope and I have to pick the features. So my scope is, as I mentioned, do I wanna target a particular management group and then everything underneath it? Or I could add particular subscriptions. I've got a lot of flexibility into what I want to be included as part of it. And then there are two sets of features. We have the idea of connectivity i.e. defining the connectivity between virtual networks, and then security admin. You can think of it like network security groups, but it's actually performed in a different way, and it gives me a, a huge amount of benefit over those network security groups. So we have those features available to us. And so when I create that instance, I tell it, well, which features do I want to use? If I was thinking of this very, very top level scope, I may not want to define connectivity, but what I may be thinking is, well, I wanna be able to define some core security rules. So maybe for this instance, I just turn on security admin. So I wanna be able to lay down rules around that connectivity. So around the connectivity, the type of traffic that can flow. Now realize the whole point of this scope is it's a boundary of management. That's what we're doing here. So I might ha absolutely have this root level one for those core security rules, but then I might have other instances. I might, for example, have another instance, maybe I'll have a, an AVMM2 instance, which is maybe scoped just at maybe those subscriptions. And maybe that's gonna be focused around connectivity and maybe security. Maybe it's doing both of those things. Maybe I have another instance over here that's scoped to some different set of subscriptions or some other management group level. I have a lot of flexibility depending on what I want to do with it. So I can create those different layers. It's unlikely you're gonna have more than two. I would see a very common pattern where I want one org level instance very specifically around that security admin. And then I might then have instances targeting whatever next layer I decide to do. 
I may want to separate out network managers based on feature. Hey, I have security. Hey, I have the idea of the connectivity. Billing is based on the number of subscriptions managed by the Azure Network Virtual Manager instance. I'm going to go into more detail on this later. But realize when I do this double layering, hey, I'm going to pay for all the subscriptions under this scope, and I'm going to pay for the subscriptions also under this scope. So if a subscription is managed by two instances, the same sub, I will be double paying for that. But I'm getting those benefits of functionality. Whereas if I have different instances managing different subscriptions, well, then I'm still only paying for those subscriptions once. So I do think about how I want to do that management and just have that billing concept in mind. Now, once I create my Azure Virtual Network Manager instance, the next construct is the idea of a network group. And I can create n number of network groups. So my next thing, we'll go to a different color here. So I'm going to create under this particular instance, I'm create n number of network groups. They have to be within the scope of that Azure Virtual Network Manager instance. So if I had a, an instance here with this scope, I couldn't reference virtual networks in other things. Now, I, I have rules to define which virtual networks are in the network group. These can be dynamic, so I can set some rules. This could be based on, um, does the name contain something? Does it have this tag existing? And I'll show you this in a second. And I can do static. Hey, I want this virtual network in it. So I have different ways to drive that membership. A single virtual network can be in multiple network groups. I might think about separating maybe production and development. There are many different combinations I might want to do here. If we go back and look at the portal, and there is a basic, so if I go and open up my existing one, you can see here, I've got this concept of network groups. So here if I go and select my network groups, I've created two. This is the main one I'm actually using. This has real virtual networks inside of here. And for the membership rules, I created both a dynamic rule and you could also then go and add static. So I can see the virtual networks inside it. I can see I have this spoke one, two, three, and then the hub itself. So I have a number of different ones within here. And this is what I'm going to use as part of the demo. So maybe just to, to make this super clear, as I go through the demonstration in my environment, just to be able to demo things, I created what well, basically two network groups. So what you're going to see throughout here is I have the idea of a hub virtual network. And I've made it very easy to tell. So the hub is a 10.100 space. And then I created a spoke one, a spoke two, and a spoke three, which is a 10.101, 10.102, and you guessed it, 10.103. So those I defined as one network group. So we'll call that spokes network group. And then I created a second network group, which I just called prod. And this one I just did a static, and I just, <laughs> the naming is poor, the VNet is actually called test, but it's got a very different IP space. So we'll be able to tell super quickly because this is a 192.168. So we've separated those out. So I have two different network groups in my demo environment. And we'll see those later on as part of this. And so what we have here is I can go ahead and create those network groups. Remember what I'm creating them for. Ultimately, I'm going to want to go and apply connectivity configurations. I'm going to want to go and apply security admin configurations to control those flows of traffic. But if we jump back over here for a second, my key point here is if I, let's just say we create a new one. Actually, never mind. Let's go to this one. And my members. 
So you can define static and dynamic memberships. If I do dynamic, I can see here I've got this JSON based approach in how I can do my rules. So I already have a rule for this one. If I go and look at my other one, which I do not have a dynamic for, it starts off with this nice little GUI. So it's very basic, but you can see I can look at things like, well, what's the name? What's the ID, the tag, subscription name, subscription ID, subscription tags, resource group name, resource group ID. And then I can do various checks on those. So this is how I can drive well, who should be in this network group. And the nice thing is, if new virtual networks get created that match this criteria, well, they will automatically then just get added and then whatever configurations or security admin rules I've applied will get applied to them. So I can do both dynamic and I can do static memberships for my network groups. So you would go through and you will create the network groups based on how I might wanna separate connectivity, how I might wanna separate out the application of security rules. I might create a default network group. I might wanna go ahead and create a default network group that has every virtual network in it. And then maybe I'm gonna apply some default set of security rules that I want to apply to every VNet. And then I can be more specific at other levels. I could then go and add specific network groups and memberships at lower levels to be maybe more granular in rules or more granular around connectivity. So I could absolutely do that. Once I have this, then I go ahead and I create configurations. Now there are two types of configuration. If we go and look again at the portal really quickly, so we created network groups, and then we're gonna go and create configurations. And we have two types available to us, connectivity and security admin. And I think those names are fairly obvious what they're going to do. But what we have here is the idea of I want to now define some aspect of that configuration. So once again, I can create, I'll use a slightly different color for this. I can create n number of configurations. And a configuration is one of those two types. So it's either connectivity and when I think about connectivity, it's basically going to be, is it hub and spoke or mesh? Remember hub and spoke, hey, I'm gonna go and talk to some hub network to use its services, but the spokes maybe can't talk to each other. Mesh, any to any, everything can talk to everything. And then we have the idea of security admin. Configuration. And a security admin configuration consists of one or more rule collections, which consist of rules. And if you've used NSGs, the rules will seem super familiar. It's the same idea of IP or service tags and ports and protocol. It really is the same thing. We've got a little bit more flexibility in the protocols we can use but it's gonna be used at a completely different level. And the key point is these will actually get checked before NSG. So these act as a funnel before the NSG even gets called. So I could block traffic so it never even gets to the NSG, or I could force traffic to be allowed through. One thing I will say, I'm gonna go into detail on all of these. When I think about meshes, when I think about hub and spoke, if I want the spokes to talk, by default, a region is still a boundary of communication. But I can override that and say, well, actually, I want everything to speak to everything, even across regions. But that's a choice I get to make. So right, and then we have the security admin rules, which might be, hey, I want to block traffic, or I want to make sure traffic can always work. This will override an NSG. Hey, I always need to be able to talk to my domain controllers. Hey, I always need to be able to talk to my update infrastructure. I can create rules to say this traffic must be allowed to, between these IPs or these service tags. And even if an NSG tried to block it, it can't, it will go through. 
So don't think of these as just good ways to block things. This can be a very good way to make sure something actually can get through and do its job. And then the whole point now is, these configurations, will they get linked to one or more network groups? And then I would deploy that configuration to actually make it take effect. So this is what we're gonna focus on. So let's dive in. So I wanna start off talking about the connectivity configurations. And remember the whole point here is we have those two options. I can do hub and spoke, and I can do a mesh. So we're gonna start off with the idea of the hub and spoke. So if we start off with hub and spoke, now I have my configuration which has got three spokes and a hub, but I wanna draw it out a little bit differently. I wanna think about well, the idea of maybe we have the hub, but maybe I have actually a lot more spokes. Maybe I've got spoke one, spoke two, spoke three, spoke four, spoke five. You can imagine it going on. Lots and lots of spokes. Now when I do the hub and spoke model, what it's going to do, and this will be familiar, it's gonna do is the idea of peers. So it will go ahead and use peering between the spokes and the hub. I also have the option of enabling, I want you to be able to use the gateway functionality in the hub. So if this had a site site VPN or an express route gateway, these spokes would then be able to use that configuration. So let's start off with hub and spoke. So that's a, a default thing we can do. So if we actually go and look at that quickly, so I could say, hey, I wanna create a new connectivity configuration. I'm just going to um, put in test, because I don't care about that. Topology, so I'm gonna pick hub and spoke. At this point, I can select, well, what is my hub virtual network? So I might say, oh, okay, well, this is my hub and then which network groups are gonna contain the spokes. So I might say, hey, my spoke network group. So you can see I've gone ahead and created the spokes first, the network group first that contains them, and then I'm gonna link that network group into this particular configuration. And this is what I've already gone ahead and created. So this is over here, my hub and spoke. And you can see I have this particular network group configured for it. And I'm actually gonna go and turn something off before I do anything. So this is not currently deployed. So just wait for that. So the dark connectivity is off. If I was to go and look at my deployments, I don't have any right now. So this is not deployed. So if I was to look at my virtual networks, and let's say I look at my hub, and I was to look at my peers, it doesn't have any. So just by creating it doesn't actually do anything. So what I have to do is, well, in that configuration, I'm gonna deploy it. So I'm gonna say, hey, I wanna deploy. I don't wanna include security in this, I just wanna deploy a configuration to my hub and spoke. And here we can see we can target particular regions. Now you might be thinking, why is that an option? Think about what the Azure Virtual Network Manager can do. It can define connectivity, it can define security admin rules, which is really, really powerful. It could have a huge impact, especially if I do it wrong. So the idea here is that I might have a certain region I use for testing purposes. So I could take my configuration and I can target just a particular region first, test it's performing how I want it to perform, it's doing what I want, and then I could go back and select all regions. So it's just giving me that ability to be granular when I think about rolling this thing out. So if we go back, so hey, I wanna deploy this configuration. 
And it's showing me the current state of configurations on the left, and then what it's going to do when I do this deployment. Now, before I do anything else, I want you to quickly look at Azure Policy. So if I look at Azure Policy right now, the only thing I really care about is I have 10 current assignments. So what I'm gonna do is let's just do deploy. So this is now pushing out that configuration. And it's normally pretty quick. So we can see it's running right now. And it's gonna go through, we can actually go and look, oh, and it says deployment is submitted. If I do a refresh, there we go. If I look at my deployments, that deployment is there. If I now go back and look at that hub VNet again, well, I can actually go and see, well, it's created a bunch of peers. Now you'll notice it's four, because that test virtual network I have as well, if I was to look at my configuration for my hub and spoke, and look at the network groups, I do have that test, that um, prod VNet in there as well. So that's why it's four peerings. It's gone ahead and it's created a peering between all of my, which is absolutely what we'd expect. So now all of those can go and talk to my hub. So that's great. That might be exactly what we want it to do. Uh, and I'm done. What if, actually, I want the spokes to be able to talk as well? So one of the things we can turn on is the idea of direct connectivity. Now, the reason I drew extras in here is I might think of the idea that these were actually over multiple regions. Maybe this is West US and this is East US. And this is important because what's gonna happen behind the scenes here is when I do direct connectivity, it's going to create something called a connectivity group. And by default, it's gonna create a connectivity group per region for the VNets in the same network group. So there's two things to think about here. When I turn on direct connectivity in the hub and spoke model, firstly, it's only gonna enable direct connectivity between the spokes in the same network group. So in my example, these three spokes will now be able to communicate with each other but they still would not be able to communicate with this spoke. So remember, that's one boundary of the communication. Even when I turn on direct connectivity, it's only enabling direct connectivity between spokes in the same network group. This would have its own connectivity group, and this would have its own connectivity group. And I'm using that term connectivity group, which is a new thing. It's a new thing to Azure Virtual Network Manager that's gonna enable the connectivity between those spokes but also the region is the boundary by default. So by default, with that direct connectivity, even if they're in the same network group, they're still separated into different direct communications by their region. So now, these will all be able to talk directly, as would they. There is another option I could also turn on, which is, global mesh. If I turn on global mesh after I've turned on direct connectivity, as you may expect, what it does is it makes these one big connectivity group. So now even across, I'm not gonna draw the arrows in, but you get the idea. Everything could talk to everything. So I have those options. So let's have a look at that. So if we jump back over here, what I want to do is change my configuration. So what I am gonna do is, I'm gonna say enable direct connectivity. I could enable it on the other prod as well, if I wanted to. 
but it's only got one in it anyway, so it really doesn't enable very much or do anything in my case. So I've now enabled that, but it has not done anything at this point. Why? I've changed the configuration, but I have to redeploy it. Now this is not, as I said, gonna use peerings, and this is a huge, huge point here. So when I do this, it uses peerings between the spoke and the hub. It is not gonna go and add a bunch of peerings between the spokes. It uses this new concept of a connectivity group that's part of the software defined networking of Azure, and will just enable direct communication between the spokes, but it's not hopping via the hub, it's not using some hidden NVA somewhere, it's literally in that software defining networking stack, it's lighting this up, which means it's not adding hops, it's not adding latency, this is a very, very powerful thing, and again, it's not using up those peerings. So what I'll do now, and I wanna show something, if I went and looked at a network interface card, so this is a NIC attached to a VM on spoke two, and what we'll see is it should have a peering connection because it's now sitting on a virtual network that is connected to the hub. So it's local, because this is spoke two, so we can see it's local virtual network is 10.102, and it has a peering connection to the hub, but it has no path to the other spokes. Doesn't exist. So what we're gonna do is we have now turned on direct connectivity, and we're gonna deploy it again. So we're gonna target same region. We're updating the goal state. We're gonna hit deploy. So this is now going through, and it would now go and create that connectivity group per network group, per region. Now you did see I had the option, you can see that's done already, once I've turned on direct connectivity, I could optionally turn on global mesh, which would then even across regions within the same network group, enable that any to any. But I'm only in one region, so that doesn't do anything, but realize that option is there. Once I turn on direct connectivity, I can obviously enable that global mesh as well, which now is that any to any communication, even if they're in multiple regions. Now let's take a quick look at the, the peering relationships. So before the hub had a peering to each spoke, absolutely, we would expect that. If I look at my spoke two, it still only has a peering to hub one. It did not add an additional peering to the other spokes. And notice I have gateway transit is disabled because in my hub and spoke configuration, I'm not using hub as a gateway. That's saying else I could turn on if I had a gateway in the hub. So how are the spokes gonna talk? Well, if I refresh the effective routes, you're gonna see the magic. And the magic is what's happening is it's created this connectivity group. And here it is, this connected group. So we can see, hey, I still have the peering to the hub but now I also have this connected group to only two VNets. So obviously it spoke three and it's spoke one. It did not add it to that other test VNet because that's in a different network group. And this is now how those spokes will talk. It's direct connectivity, but it's not using peering. This is just some magic going on as part of the software defined networking stack. The other thing that happened when I deployed this configuration, the first time I did it, if we refresh our assignments, notice there's 10, we now have 11. It went ahead and created this for this particular Network Manager instance. And this is how it tracks the membership. This is how it gets notified of if a new virtual network becomes a member of this, then it will get told and can go and update the various connector groups and all the other things it needs to do. So it's leveraging Azure policy behind the scenes to help manage and control a lot of these things happening. And this really is kind of a key point of the Azure Virtual Network Manager. This idea of this 
connectivity group is only available in Azure Virtual Network Manager. For anything else, I'd have to be adding a whole bunch of peers. It doesn't have to do that. It's using its own construct to enable this. There are a few notes. A virtual network can be part of multiple connectivity configurations. So if I'm part of multiple connectivity configurations, I'm gonna get part of multiple connected groups, but it can only be a member of two. So a particular virtual network, let's say it was a member of two different connectivity configurations, if they both had a mesh of some kind, it's okay. I can be part of two connectivity groups, but only two. Now that combination could be, hey, I'm part of a hub and spoke with direct connectivity on, and I'm part of a mesh, or maybe I'm part of two meshes, or part of two hub and spokes, both of them with direct connectivity on. It wouldn't be that much point to that, but maybe it is but I can only be a member of two. So just bear that in mind. So there's multiple configurations I can do about that. There is a limit today of 250 VNets in a connected group, but that, that may change in the future. So that's the hub and spoke. So you can see there's a, a lot of power in what I'm doing there. And what I'm gonna do as I start talking, as you know, we'll just carry on for now. It'll catch up. The other thing that I just wanted to quickly um, make sure you do think about is I drew the picture of the regions, but again, just to, I guess it's a really important thing to emphasize. If I had this same model of a hub, and maybe my virtual networks this time was production one, production two, production three, dev one and dev two, if my the way I define my uh, connected groups, think of them as boxes, remember? So this was one network group, so this was network group prod, and then this was network group dev. If I turned on that hub and spoke configuration, so hey, it went and created the peers, just like this, and then I turned on, oh, and also I would like the direct connectivity. It's gonna create two separate connected groups. Even if they're in the same region, it's gonna create this connected group so that these can all speak and then separately create this connected group so that these, so the network group is a boundary when I turn on that direct connectivity in the hub and spoke model. So it's not just gonna enable everything to speak, that would maybe be a bad thing for me. So it will still separate out the different network groups, which is a great reason why we want to have those different network groups, because we're gonna have a different connectivity configurations, maybe different security admin rules and um, controlling those different things. So just make sure that's kind of an important thing to understand as part of your planning. If this was hub and spoke, well then the other obvious one I have is just the idea of mesh. And mesh is maybe very simple to understand. Hey, I've got a bunch of virtual networks. So you've been there, one, two, three, four. And when I turn on mesh, it's gonna enable communication between all of them. Now, once again, it's bound by region. So by default, it's connectivity within the same region. So it's gonna go ahead, and how it's doing this, uh, you probably guessed it, it's not using peering. You will not see any peers created at all. The only time Azure Virtual Network Manager ever uses a peer is hub and spoke between the spokes and the hub. And then as we know, it uses connected groups for the spokes to talk if I wanna turn that on with direct connectivity. If I do a mesh, it just uses a connectivity group. There's zero spokes, there's zero peers. There are no peers created. And I can optionally turn on 
a global mesh. So then it wouldn't have a connectivity group per region. It would just enable everything to everything through it. So let's see that in action. So what we're gonna do is firstly, let's remove the existing deployment. So currently I have a deployment and I wanna remove it. So I just select it, remove deployment. And now what is, I want connectivity in my goal state and I want none. I want to remove my existing connectivity configuration. I'll target my South Central, or I could just do select all. Next, deploy. So now it's showing me my goal state is nothing. So what we should see is two things happening here. Because it was hub and spoke, and it had the idea of the connected group, I should see the peering get deleted once this is complete. So if I go back to my spoke, so it's deleting, I can see that right now. If I go and look at my hub, it's deleting all the spokes. And if I go and now refresh the routes, I should have seen the peering route go away and I should see the connected group go away because I've completely removed that configuration for me. So now, yep, those have disappeared. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to say, okay, let's go back to our configuration. Now I already deployed, created a mesh, but once again, it will just be a new connectivity. I will just put in test. I would select mesh. I can enable it across regions if I want to. So I don't have a connectivity group per region. Now just add in the network groups I want. So I can select whichever ones I want in there and I'm good to go. I've created that already. So I've got mesh and we can see I've just got my network group spokes in there. And what we'll do is we'll actually add in uh, the prod as well. So now I've got both of those as part of this and we'll deploy it. So let's do deploy. We want to deploy the mesh, we deploy it to South Central, next, and deploy. Now, if I ever change a configuration, so if I change the topology, if I change to turn on some new feature, if I change to go and turn on uh, the global, I have to redeploy. I don't have to redeploy if new virtual networks are created, and now a part of a network group. That will get detected and just rolled out automatically, so I'm good there. If I ever change my connectivity, if I ever go and add network security admin rules, I have to redeploy that configuration because maybe I want to make the changes, but not ready to deploy it yet. So I always have to go and make that deploy step to make it become the reality. Okay, so that is now deployed. If we go back, I can see, okay, mesh is deployed. If I go and look at my hub, remember it's got the same VNet, there's no peerings. Did not create any peerings. But if I now go and refresh the effective routes and see what it's done, what I'm expecting to see is a single, and this is gonna be the interesting point this time, a single connectivity connected group, but notice it has three in it. And it includes that 192168. Obviously the other three is the hub, because that's just being treated as an anything now, and the two other spokes. But this is a key point. With mesh, it behaves differently than hub and spoke. So remember with hub and spoke, if I had different network groups, part of the topology, and I turned on direct connectivity, it still separated out the different network groups. Mesh does not do that. With mesh, it is turning on any to any. So if three and four were part of a different network group, as in my example here, it's still part of the same connectivity group, it's still any to any. So if you went and turned on mesh and I had a prod and a dev network group that were part of that configuration, hey, dev and prod can talk. So that's a big difference between them. Hub and spoke, hey, I turn on direct connectivity, it's enabling direct connectivity between the spokes in the same network group, 
not between them. If this was mesh, they can all talk. The network group is not a boundary. Only the region is a boundary unless I turn on that, hey, um, cross region, which is one of those capabilities. I can do that global mesh. And so that's really the whole point of the connectivities here. If I make any change, I have to redeploy. If appearing already exists, I actually have an option when I deploy. When I deploy, it can say remove existing peerings or it will just leave them alone. Uh, I can have two hubs. I might have the idea of multiple hubs. I would just create two configurations, each with its own hub. I can still, I can still add manual peers if I wanted to. So these things generally work together. All of these configurations are additive, which is why I can have multiple ones. It's adding connectivity. I can still manually go and add my own connectivity to that. So I have a lot of flexibility around this. So it is brownfield friendly. If I have existing things, it will leave it there or it will give me the choice. Hey, do you want to delete things? If it's there already, it does give you that choice. So I always have that ability. So hopefully you can see the power of this, that now I can centrally define that. And again, if I create a new VNet, if it becomes part of some network group by the dynamic rules or I add it, it will just automatically become part of that connectivity structure, whichever one I've defined. So this is really now centralizing and simplifying that whole process. So that's connectivity. Now, obviously the other thing we wanna have here are security admin rules. So this is, about the idea, and it's working very similar to how policies work with network security groups. Network security groups are actually enforced in the virtual filtering platform on the host. So they're, they're always, if, if I'd apply an NSG to a subnet or a NIC, they're actually enforced the same way. It doesn't actually make any difference. But I can think about with a security admin configuration, we have that idea of the virtual network. So I have my VNet, well, security admin rules, well, they're deployed to the VNet. They're enforced at the VNet. Remember, that's very different from a network security group. Now, a security group is targeted on a particular subnet, or I can even target a particular NIC. So the security admin rules are done at a very, very different level. But they have exactly the same idea around destination IP, ports, protocols. If we go and take a look, I'm just gonna fall out of this for a second. And what I'm actually gonna do is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna delete this, remove the deployment, include connectivity, none. So I'll just let that go and remove itself. And that's one of the great things about this. It's so easy to play around. I'm going to spin this up. I create a bunch of little VNets and I can play and try. There's really no harm. When I delete it, it removes the connections. It removes the peers. It removes the connectivity group. It's fantastic and easy to use. So if I now go and look at configurations, I can create a security admin configuration. So this is going to have security admin rules. And all I do is I can create modules. So I can create a module, I can create a rule collection. So I might say this is called um, test one. You want to do something more useful. Maybe this would be, for example, allow rules. This is maybe going to be rules that are going to enforce the ability to talk to my domain controllers or my update infrastructure. I can say which network groups I want to target with this. And then within the rule collection, so the rule collection is who am I targeting? And then I can have, well, what are the rules I want to add? And this is going to look exactly like network security groups. I have a priority, I think it's zero to 99. The lower the number, the higher its priority. I have my actions, my direction, inbound, outbound, my protocols. I have some extra ones. ESP and AH are good for IPsec. But then it's the same idea of, hey, is it an IP address or a service tag? I have all those various services I can use there. So it's looking very, very similar to what we have with an NSG. It's operating at layer four, great. But if I look at my actions for a second, these will also seem very familiar. Hey, I can allow the traffic, great. I can deny the traffic, also great. 
I can always allow the traffic. This is a new option. I don't see this with NSGs. Regardless of other rules with a lower priority or NSGs. So what, what exactly does this mean? What is this thing doing right here? So let's remember the scenario. We have the idea of traffic coming in. So we have traffic. Think of the security admin rules operating as a funnel. So those are gonna get hit first before any NSG. Now, these are still enforced, again, at the virtual filtering platform, so it's still super efficient. It's not gonna add any overhead or latency, so it's super, super efficient, but they're gonna get hit first. So what we now have is, hey, security admin rules that are part of those configurations that are targeting certain network groups. And then maybe we also then have, hey, we have the NSG waiting behind it that someone's applied at a subnet level or they've applied at a NIC level. It's gonna hit this first. So now we have a choice. We can say, allow. So if I say allow, it carries on through the funnel. It goes through the funnel and will then hit NSGs. It may also hit lower security admin rules. Remember we have the hierarchy. Remember that whole point? So maybe I had a security admin rule that says allow, well then someone lower down with a lower down scope said block, no, no. Um, maybe I don't want that behavior. So if I just say allow, and then it hits one that says block, well then these would block it. Maybe I don't want that. The other obvious thing I could do is I might just say, deny. And it will just stop it dead. If I deny it, it never goes any further. It doesn't go to an SG, it doesn't go to lower security admin rules. But maybe I need to make sure it always goes through. And that's where we have always allow. If I select always allow, it doesn't go through any lower security admin rules. It doesn't ever touch the NSGs. They can't stop this traffic. Now, if there was an Azure firewall as part of the path, if there was a firewall inside a guest OS, obviously it could stop the traffic there. But from the Azure networking constructs, if I do always allow, it bypasses anything underneath it. They cannot block that traffic. So, hey, I need Kerberos to always work to these IP addresses. And we can see that. So if I actually went and looked, for example, at my configuration for a second, let's kill this off. So if I just go and look at the one I created, core rules. So I created a rule collection and I got two rules in it. I'm denying from the internet um, ports 2021. So unencrypted FTP, I'm always denying it. But then UDP outbound from my VNet to these particular IPs on port 88 I am always allowing. So no one could ever block that. There's no way for them to block that. So what I'm gonna quickly do is let's just go to this and let's deploy it. And we have the same idea. I could include a connectivity config if I wanted to. I'll target my region. I'll hit next and I'll hit deploy. So now deploying that rule. So this is now pushing that configuration out and they will now be enforced again at the host level. Depending on my rules, it influences what can happen underneath it. Let's take a look. How is this, how is this visualized? So if I was to now go and look, I think that's complete. 
once again, you're going to have that initiative that helps track if there's changes. But if I refresh the look of the networking, and this can take a little while sometimes, notice it's checking for additional rules. Okay, it's not shown up yet. But eventually what will happen is I will see those rules actually show up. Now these have to propagate out to the host, so this, this does take a little bit of time. But those rules that I have defined, they're actually gonna show up and be vis visible as well. So eventually, I mean, I can maybe go and check on the NIC, but I still don't think it's gonna be that quick. It just takes a little bit of time, so we may come back to this in a couple of minutes. Let's just see if it's there yet. So there is a propagation time when I deploy these out, especially when it's doing things. Okay, so we can see there, oh, that's just my NSG still. Okay, so no, it's not shown up yet. So we're gonna come back to this. So let's just think about for a second, I talked about priority and overriding in a, a lower level security admin. So what does that actually mean? So remember we had that idea of scopes. So remember I could absolutely have a concept here where, hey, I've got my Azure AD, I've got my root management group, I've got that whole hierarchy of management groups, whatever that looks like. And then I eventually have kind of a bunch of subscriptions where I have virtual networks. And maybe I'm in that configuration where I have a certain instance, Azure Virtual Network Manager 1, that has this scope. So remember, its scope is at the, really the highest level it could be. And maybe I have some security admin rules. And then maybe I have another Azure Virtual Network Manager instance. Its scope is maybe a, a lower management group or maybe even specific subscriptions. And it also has security admin rules. And maybe they conflict. This says always allow. This says deny. Well, this is going to win. It has a higher scope. It has a higher priority. So regardless of what I try and do, uh, security admin rules at lower scopes or NSGs, if it was an NSG pointed to a subnet here, the higher the scope of the Azure Virtual Network Manager, the higher up the hierarchy, it is gonna win. So it's always gonna win any conflict between lower level Azure Virtual Network Manager instances, any NSGs I'm linking to that. I wanna see if those rules showed up yet. It can take some time, so I may have to do a bit of magic of editing uh, if this still isn't showing up. Let's try and do refresh. So magic editing. And we should find them this time. <laughs> so notice what we can see. Hey look, associated Azure Network Manager. And if I actually now go and look at the VM itself, and let's make it go and refresh its page, so it's checking for additional rules, it will now see the rules that we had in those security admins. So I can see, because I'm looking, remember, at inbound port rules, well, notice it's, hey, I'm denying that FTP. If I look at outbound port rules, I can see, and notice the priority is zero, so it's absolute. Hey, we're allowing in, so we're allowing out <laughs> to my domain controllers. So we can see those rules have gone and taken effect um, right there. So these really are amazingly powerful sets of capabilities we have. Again, remember that priority order. Now, because of the risk of conflict, my understanding is right now, I can only have one security admin configuration per AVM per region deployed um, for the network group to avoid the risk of conflicts within uh, a particular AVM instance. So there we can see we can block things. We can force things so they can always get through. Now what is the pricing of this? And hopefully you've seen kind of the value of this. You pay per, so if we go back to this higher up scope, 
you pay per subscription managed within the scope per Azure Network Virtual Manager. Azure Virtual Network Manager, did that the wrong way around. So if that subscription is only managed by one AVNM, hey, I'm, I'm paying one. If I have multiple AVNMs, I can't believe I that the wrong way around, and it's the same subscription, so in this scenario, it's gonna drive me nuts actually. In this same scenario, a VNM, let's just do this the right way. I had maybe that top level instance, and I had that, right that way, that weird. And I had the same subscriptions managed by another instance. Remember this instance was maybe just doing security admin, and it was all of the subscriptions, so I'm paying that 10 cents uh, per managed subscription per hour, and I had another AVNM managing maybe these subscription, subscription two and three, would be paying that per hour as well. So do bear in mind when I think about those scopes, you don't wanna waste money. So I can see if I look at the pricing, it's just telling me it's 10 cents per hour per subscription managed, but that is per AVNM. So if I have multiple AVNMs and they do overlap, then I will pay for those subscriptions twice. So another reason I wouldn't go too many levels of this, because I'd just be spending a whole bunch of money. But hopefully that clears up kind of the goal of this. The goal is if I think about, hey, I want that connectivity. I want to be able to manage that at scale. Maybe I don't want to have all those peering connections. Hey, I want to have these particular security rules to maybe force certain traffic through or block certain traffic. Think of a zero day. And I want to be able to really quickly block a certain type of traffic through all of my VNets. Imagine trying to have NSGs. Imagine now with this, add a rule deploy and I'm done. So it really is a game changer. So when I think about that management at scale, this really where it comes into play. Think connectivity, think about the types of traffic I wanna block or allow. Probably gonna have my network admins leverage this, maybe my core governance teams leverage this. It's just that new solution on thinking about how I manage. What is a core aspect of really everything? those networks. So I hope that was useful. Uh, until next video, take care.